Morning. Would you please stand? Let's worship the Lord together. Thank God for his salvation, every blessing, every spiritual gift. Thank you, Lord. I'm trading my sorrow. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my weakness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sorrow. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my weakness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. You say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse that His promise will endure. That His joy is gonna be my strength. Though the sorrow may last for the night, His joy comes in the morning. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my weakness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. You say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Joy of the Lord, for the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this great exchange. Our sorrows for your joy. We bless you, Lord. As we go into this next song, let's take a moment and greet one another, but heartily. Let's express the love of Christ to the body of Christ. Don't be afraid. No dead fish handshakes.
This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. All that he's done for us. The work is finished. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth? Justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is a daily life. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. done for me. All you've done for us, all you did for us, Lord, that one righteous act in that moment of time, your death on the cross, that sacrifice on our behalf. We thank you, Lord, all you've done for us.
everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. understanding is infinite. Lord, we love to sing of this power, to contemplate this power, the same power that brought the resurrection from the dead, and the same power that will one day raise our mortal bodies when we will be changed, and we will meet you in the air. Lord, we think of that day the voice of the archangel and the trumpet sounding and you Lord descending from heaven with a shout thank you Lord we look further to the future of a new heaven and a new earth age upon age gleaning from mysteries that were veiled during the time on earth the time of our sojourning the time of our infirmity but in that place all things will be revealed. And most of all, we will see you, our heart's desire, face to face. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the kingdom that can't be moved. What a 
We need you in these troublesome times as never before. May we as believers be sober and walk carefully, circumspectly. May our minds be braced with truth. Help us to be aware, cognizant of this holy mission. Lord, we don't want to simply be spectators, but participants with you communing with you, knowing your purpose on this earth, Lord, involved in this mission. You're our God. You're our God. Oh, God, you are my God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. With our mouths, just for a moment, let's praise the Lord Jesus Christ, who's worthy of all our praises. Lord Jesus, we thank you. You're our God. You've saved our souls. You lead us. You lead us. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, bless this service now. Amen. Please be seated. Hello? Yeah, great. All right. Hey, praise God. It's a good day today. Huh? It is. It's a good day today. Praise the Lord. Um, we have a great service today. Wow. Praise God. What, what do you think? Amen. We got a great service today. Really? We do. We do. We got a good one. And because uh, God is here and God is working in the lives of so many people. And I hear it on the phone and emails and all kinds of testimonies, actually, from around the world, too, you know, from churches and Asia and God's work. And right here, uh, Jeremy. Can you come up for a second? This guy is Jeremy. Let me just tell. I want him to give a. I want him to you get a selfie. Come on, let's do the selfie. We're okay. Live. okay. Oh, we're live. Oh, ooh. viral. Everyone can see. It's it. viral. Okay. So, all right. He he has. Maybe you've heard the testimony. But I think tonight we'll just have some what we can call popcorn testimonies, which, you know, that means you get a few sentences, not a lot. But no, no your time's, you're going to get more time because your story is amazing. We were telling them on Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. We were outreaching to many souls. Yeah, we were. We were a fish of men. We were. Reeling them in. Okay. Okay. He, he doesn't have the microphone yet. Wait until he gets a microphone. Okay, so that'll come. That's coming. Okay. Yeah, you can sit down. Thank you. No, it's good. I mean, I mean, God is at work in in our lives, your life, in our, you know. And uh, just to say, um, uh, we want to hear from you. We want to hear the testimonies from. You, yeah, you. Turn to your neighbor and say, you. Yeah, you. You better come up with one. God, hey, listen, you. All right, listen. When God is at work like he is in our church, then, then we need an opportunity to say it to the whole body. And so we're going to have the microphone, you know, at different times just come down to you and you get a few sentences. Yeah, a whole three sentences, <laughs> all together, all together, okay? And the, the person with the microphone, you, you can't give the microphone to Jeremy. No, you, in that case, I think. It, no, he, he, when, you, when you go too long, they back, they back off, <laughs> yeah, and it's over, okay? But why do we do that? I don't want to do that, but why do we do that? 
Well, I'm saying I don't want to back off with the microphone, but why do we do it? Because it's too, it'll be too long. Because have you ever heard a testimony? I was on the plane, and I was on the 17th row. No, wait a minute. I was in the 15th row. And it was Thursday morning. No, no, I think it was Friday. Okay, so the microphone is withdrawn. Okay, so... Uh, get ready, because God is at work in life, answered prayer, uh, speaking to hearts, um, ministering. Carl, is Carl here? Tall Carl. Carl, you want to stand up for a second? Okay. He said to me yesterday, he, he didn't know I'm, I'm thinking about this this way, but he said, I, I got a testimony. I got something to say. I go, what is it? He said, I got to tell him about body life. Right, Carl? Wow. Yeah, that's what he said to me. I go, great. I want you to say it. It's going to happen. We got to do this. Sorry, not right now. Okay. Okay, I just, you know, that, I shot a blank right there. All right, but he, he there are people sitting here that have, can say something that is so edifying and it's the evidence of God working with us. I want to be part of a congregation, and I am, that God is moving. And we just need to give you the opportunity to say things. Because what you have to say will edify us. And we'll glorify God and say, God, thank you, you know, what you're doing. And then the prayers that are prayed and the encouragement. And, I mean, good things are happening. I'm very thankful, very thankful. Praise God. Wow. Okay, so that's one thing. The second thing is, in the services at times, uh, we'll say at the end of the service, we have five minutes or ten minutes more. We'll end a little early. And if you come to church with a heavy heart, anybody here ever come to church with a heavy heart? Okay, I come to church, and I need something. And I listen to a, a message, and I appreciate it, and it ministers to me. But I still, I would like somebody to pray for me or put their hand on me. Or I need to talk to somebody personally. So we have a platform here of pastors. And what, what we're going to do is have people come down front and just uh, get a special touch. Uh, prayer. Say, you know, Pastor, I'm not going into, de into any details, but I, I'm just going to believe that God will answer your prayer and my prayer. So pray, have a prayer for me. And we want, because we're going to, because we do all we can to build up the body. And that's a beautiful part of the church service. I don't want you just to come from, you know, pull into the parking lot, come into the service, listen, I mean, sing, worship, and, and listen, and I, I want you to do all that, and that is so powerful, but I also want you to feel and sense that you can give something. You can be here participating and sharing what God is doing. Amen? Okay. All right, so go ahead, Pastor Jason. Don't we love our pastor? Amazing. Yes. <laughs> wow. Okay, right now, if you're with us for the first time, we'd love to welcome you. You've never been in our service before. Could you raise your hand? We have a special uh, gift for you this morning. Great. Wonderful. Let's give him a great big hand. Thanks for being with us. God bless you. If you don't have one of our packets, come to our Welcome Center. We'd, be, we'd love to uh, give you that. And uh, it's, it's amazing. Our church has a lot to offer. We're going to have a footsteps graduation here in a few minutes. And Monday nights is a great time to do. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, this brother speaks Swahili, I think. Is there a Swahili, Swahili translation? Does anybody know? Is there? Okay, I'm sorry. Yep, our translation's right there in the far corner if you want to. Go back there, and we'll take good care of you. Um, next Sunday, I wanted just to kind of bring a, 
attention. We have a beautiful family time next Sunday. It's our Thanksgiving potluck. How many remember that last year? It's an amazing time. Right after the 11 o'clock service, we're going to be at our family center eating lots of good food and having a family time and also fellowship. And uh, we're in need of a few, vo- few volunteers. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about that, please come to our Welcome Center. And also, if you'd like to help give food for that event, come back to our Welcome Center so you can uh, know which stuff to bring, okay? Some good food and good desserts, and we certainly welcome you there, okay? How many are planning on being there next, next Sunday by the grace of God? Okay, beautiful. All right, wonderful. Okay, our Shishmanian. I'll tell you, it's so humbling to come up here on this stage and see this body. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, band. Thank you, singers. Don't they deserve an extra hand? So um, I get to be the blessed person that gets to talk about Veterans Day. Spent 32 years in the Air Force, but it's not about me. It's about faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So um, I would just share with you a brief testimony. Yesterday, Linus and his wife and I were at Applebee's. And that's one of those uh, perks for veterans. On Veterans Day or the day previous, you can go and, you know, just have a variety of restaurants you can visit. And uh, so we were there, and uh, there were a lot of other veterans present. And uh, so I started, you know, this Shishmane guy is kind of a little strange. So he started singing the Air Force anthem. And one of the guys at the counter uh, kind of raised his hand, and I went over to talk to him. And I was just sharing, you know, we were building a relationship. But Linus came over, and he shared with each one of them a card and an invitation to come to this church. And I don't know if they're here this morning, but I know that the love of God through us in that restaurant, honoring veterans, touched those two men. Thank you. That deserves a hand for God. So if you served in the Army, please stand. If you served in the Navy, please stand. In the Marines, the Air Force, or the Coast Guard, please stand. And please remain standing. Sorry about that. (laughs) Let's pray. So, Lord, we just thank you for your faithfulness to our country and the faithfulness of so many men and women who have served and died for our freedoms. And, Lord, thank you that we can freely practice knowing you, walking with you, being a body with you after your own heart. We pray, God, for those families that 365 days a year deal with being a veteran and loss, for 365 days a year that deal with the freedom and protecting it, protecting it, Lord, that we can just have a free country to worship as we choose. And third, Lord, we pray that as Christians and as those that have served in the military, we would have a service before self. We would have a desire to honor those around us, to witness, Lord, to share with them your truth so they can be uh, in the Lord's army, Lord, and they can be eternally yours. And we thank you and praise you and give you all the glory. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning. We have a group of 10 people graduating from Seven Footsteps this morning. And uh, so uh, Seven Footsteps is a series uh, that takes place Monday evenings at 7 o'clock in our cafe. And it provides an opportunity for folks to learn about our church and its ministries, to grow in their faith, and also to learn how to participate in the church through helping, ministering, and serving. And so at this time, we want to invite all of our graduates to come forward and to join me up here on stage. Got a great group.
So we're going to be honoring each of our graduates with a new Bible and also a certificate for a free course in our Bible college. So they're going to be blessed. So we want to honor each of them. Be line right up here behind me. Beautiful group. So uh, starting off, we have Edo Ekwai. Come forward, and Pastor Sha- or Pastor, one of these pastors is going to take care of you there with a new. Let's just give them a hand, each one of them, as they receive their. And then Ken Slocum. They're going to take care of you there. And his wonderful wife, uh, Jane Slocum. And then we have this gentleman, Damon Jackson. <laughs> and, and then we have Sarah Morales. And Wanda, Wanda Kunkowski. <laughs> and next we have Mary Satorius. We had this group of five ladies that sat together and came every step, and they're like a team right here, these five ladies. And Patricia Trebes. Patricia Trebes. And last but not least, the ringleader is Yvonne Miss Kimmon. So there's a new series on the Blue Flyer. It's called The Next Step. So all of our graduates present and any graduates from the past can join in this new series. It's called How Do You Discover Your Gifts? And it also takes place at 7 o'clock on Monday evenings. Thank you very much. Give another hand to our graduates. Please welcome Pastor Bob Colban. Good morning. Um, This is the offering time. And if you're uh, maybe new or relatively new, um, just so you know, we we take an offering every service and we usually have uh, a couple of minutes of encouragement to give. And and I was thinking uh, this morning, I don't know why I was thinking this way, it's the way my brain works, but uh, that over the 40 years that I've been a believer, I have heard somewhere between five and 6,000 offering messages. And, uh, uh, and I actually thought I'd given, I've actually given two or 3,000 offering messages, two or 300, excuse me, not two or 3,000, myself. And, you know, um, uh, I was just thinking back over the past and messages that I've heard and, and encouraging us to give. And, uh, you know, some of them have been, you know, very biblically based in the sense of like the, uh, teaching on tithing, teaching on giving teaching on offerings, um, teaching on the words of Christ as far as, you know, take no thought for tomorrow, your father knows you have needs, just amazing biblical teachings about giving. Um, I've also heard over the years testimonies, testimonies of uh, great men and women of God throughout history that have... uh, you know, testified of the amazing grace of God as far as supplying the needs, whether it's George Mueller and his, and his orphanages or Billy Graham and his ministries and, and how God has always come through and been faithful to them. And uh, also we've heard many testimonies about this church and uh, the work of this church, not just here amongst us uh, as this is our local church, but also the importance of this church to the city of Baltimore, Baltimore County, Harford County, and also the importance of this church to uh, the world and uh, what we do. And so we've heard these amazing testimonies about our church, about people. We've heard personal testimonies uh, of people that have come up from the congregation and shared how God has been faithful to them. We've also had some funny stories over the years. We've had jokes over the years. And I remember we used to have a guy who was a state trooper who would come up, I don't know how many of you remember this, and he would give trooper tips before he did the offering. Like, don't drive down 95 and try and uh, open your convertible top and different things like this, you know? It doesn't work well. And we've had times where we have just prayed for the offering, and I'm sure all of you can relate to many of these uh, 
In my case, it's been five or 6,000 of these. And, and all I really wanted to say is, is this, you know, I don't think any of us need to be convinced of the importance of giving because this local church is supported by us, the people that come here. And I don't think it's a matter of being convinced. I think we've been convinced over the years. But I think it comes down to we want to give. We have a desire to give. Maybe we have a conviction to give. But there's also, a, a, you know, kind of like another thing that speaks to us. And, I, and it's this. It's our checkbook. And for those of you under 25 who don't know what this is, this is a checkbook. <laughs> Actually, it's empty. So... Uh, but we, it, for those of you, the young people, the checks come in here and you write them and you can give them to the church or pay your BG&E bill, whatever you do. But, uh, but you know, this speaks to us also, doesn't it? We hear an encouraging message. We're con- we're, we we want to give. We're convinced to give. And then we look at our checkbook and our checkbook says no. And, you know, so it's not a matter of being convinced by what people say up here. I think it's a matter of do we trust the one who says and tells us and and convinces us to give. And it really comes down to an issue of trust. It's not about money, because money is nothing to God. But do we trust God for our finances and for our life? And I'll just, this little testimony, when we were first, uh, maybe we were saved a couple of years, my wife and I, and I remember we were always struggling financially. We had two children at the time, and I think at the time my tithe was like $20 a week, um, and that was 10% of what we made. And I remember saying one day to God, like, you know, if I didn't have to tithe, we would be making it, you know? We would, that, that 20 bucks was a lot to us. If I didn't have to tithe, uh, you know, we'd be doing much better financially. And, you know, two weeks later, I didn't even ask. My boss gave me a raise, uh, 50 cents an hour. And 50 cents an hour times 40 hours, if you do the math, is $20. And God said, okay, well, here's your 20 bucks, you know? And it was like, you know, God says that to us, and I'll just quote, he says, prove me. He doesn't say that about a lot of things, but in Malachi 3.10, he says it about giving, prove me today. And, you know, that's an amazing, can you imagine God in heaven saying to each one of us personally, like, prove me today, and you will see that you can trust me. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, that you are really the only one. Lord, who says something and stands behind it and never wavers. And when you say you can trust me, uh, your character, your nature, everything about you is behind that promise. And Lord, so we just pray today for each one of us individually and each family here, God, that you would not just convince us, because I think you've done it, but help us to trust you in our giving. In Jesus' name, amen.
Okay. Okay. Could you stand, please? Great. <clears throat> Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Did you already greet each other? I don't remember. You did that? Okay. How many times did you do it? <laughs> okay. Romans chapter 8. Uh, okay. Let's see. Oh, Pastor Yashar is here tonight, today. Pastor Yashar is from Baku, Azerbaijan. Pastor Yashar. Yashar, I mean. Yashar. Okay, there he is. Okay. Pastor Yashar is from Baku, Azerbaijan, and he's here with us today. It's good to have him. So I just wanted to give a shout out. Yeah. Uh, Romans 8. Okay, you may be seated. Romans chapter 8, one simple truth written in the scripture regarding people, something like a cliff, there's a man here, and there's a ledge there, and let's put a ledge there, and uh, a common view that people have regarding sin is that we have sinned and we've fallen off the ledge and we landed there. Uh, fallen off the edge and landed on a, le a, le a ledge, yeah. Off the edge on a ledge. Okay. In that if we are really sincere, we can make our way back up maybe with some effort, sincerity, good intentions. Uh, this is very common. Uh, people that do not know the Bible, do not know the gospel, people that do not know uh, what it means to be a sinner would think this way. I made some mistakes. I'm not so good in my life every, all the time, every day, but I'm quite good, you know. Generally, the people believe man is good and some are bad. But the Bible teaches all of us, all of us. We have not fallen just to a ledge there or here, but it's been total fall, all of us. You say, Pastor, I work at the hospital. I work with a doctor. He is such a great guy. You would not believe it. He is so self-sacrificing, uh, so honest. Such uh, honor is put upon that man. It's amazing. You cannot say he is so bad. But, in fact, we are all this way, like 100%. Let me try to explain it to you. If you have a drum of drinking water and you just put a little drop uh, of something unclean in the drinking water, would you drink it? Maybe you would. I remember I was in Cyprus. I told the story sitting with a group of people eating a sandwich. This man, before he ordered, he got in an argument with the waiter. The waiter brought the food, gave him his sandwich, and he just sat there like this. And he would lift up the top roll, look at it, and put it back and sit for more than an hour. And I was watching because he was sitting next to me. Uh, and I asked the pastor, why didn't he eat his sandwich? He said, because he... Because of the argument he got with the waiter, he believed that the waiter spit in his sandwich and wouldn't eat it. Okay, would you eat the sandwich? 
I definitely would if I paid for it. <laughs> and I wouldn't believe he spit in it. But I got the idea that maybe he had worked in a restaurant and spit in somebody's sandwich. <laughs> and it's coming back on him now. Okay? What I'm trying to say is that doctor at the hospital, as honorable as he is, has a nature that is totally fallen and we are all like an unclean thing. In the eyes of God, he knows all about us. And because of this sin that happened with Adam and Eve, they didn't fall off a cliff, literally, but by, by illustration, we're saying they sinned and the fall was complete and great. And there's no way you can make it back up. You cannot save yourself. You cannot redeem yourself. You cannot restore yourself. This is in the context of, of God, of find favor with God. I am an enemy of God. This is 100% for sure. You say, but pastor, I know these people believe in God. I, yes, I understand that. But the scripture is clear. If you take away from people their money, their food, their water, their housing, their bed, if you take away from them their wife or their children, if you hurt them, if you, you put people under pressure, something comes out. It comes out. And, and we understand that we're human beings. I am saying that in the eyes of God, we are all an unclean thing. And there was no way any of us could make it to heaven. Meaning, none of us could be justified, or none of us could be righteous before a holy God. Just like if you had a bucket of water with one drop of something unclean in it, you're not going to drink it. So God cannot relate to us this way. He had to do something about it. And this is the message of the gospel. God went all the way here, and he brought us all the way up higher than Adam and Eve. Where Adam and Eve were in the garden, Christ went all the way to the Father. Adam and Eve were mortal. Christ is glorified. I mean, they had mortal bodies. Adam and Eve, though they had not yet the sentence of death on them, still they were not yet glorified. But Christ ascended up glorified at the right hand of the Father. We that have believed in him have been made righteous. An amazing gift of grace, 100% Righteous, For he that knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, this assurance is important for us because uh, assurance has an effect on you and I. It reveals the nature of our God. And this is the only Doctrine in all the world, any te this is the only gospel. Other messages are more like this. You have fallen, landed on the ledge, make your way back. You make your way back. In Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and of course in the Christian faith, they could go to a a church and hear that kind of teaching where you pull yourself up by the book bootstraps, you improve yourself, you be good long enough, you make your way back. But it isn't true. No, this is not the gospel. Let me make another point regarding that. In civil law, when a man murders somebody and he's 20 years old, and he, in his heart, is sorry for what he did. He murdered somebody when he was 20 years old, but he never was caught. And in 40 years, he lived as a good man. 
Maybe even he became a religious man. Whatever it is that he did when he's now 60 years old and he's found out, he could say to the court, yes, I did this, but for 40 years I've been a good man. Will the 40 years cancel out what he did at 20? It will not. He will go to jail. Your goodness cannot cancel out the problem that you have in your life of sin. There is no way that I, as a good man, could cancel out my sin. It must be a totally different uh, system, totally different message, a work of the cross. This is the difference. That God became a man so that we would be justified. God became a man so we, his blood would wash our sin away. God, Christ came so that we would be saved by grace, not by anything we do, but believe. When you believe, you're just believing. It's an attitude, believing, that's all. When, when my daughter was little, I put her on top of the car and, and just step back and just say, jump. And she'd look at me. I go, come on. Get a little closer to her to make her feel she could do it. Come on. And she just did it. What was that? What did it mean to me as a dad? Uh, yeah, like my daughter, I'm having fun with her. What do I enjoy about it? Relationship. I want a relationship with my daughter. I want her to feel like she can trust me. And I would be, and if I, if I had her fall, that would be a tragic thing in my relationship with her. She'd be on the ground crying, and she'd be like, you know, Daddy, why did you do that, right? It's not a good thing. When you catch her, <laughs> hug her, kiss her, put her back up, do it again, start, she starts doing flips off the back and, you know, half gainers and, and the whole thing. And, and you, you as a dad or mom or friend or whatever case it may be, are enjoying the relationship. You enjoy it. You want to catch her. You want her to love you. You want to love her. Very simply, God is saying, you got problems, I am God. I am the one you need. I am not like other gods. And nor am I thinking the way you are thinking. Isaiah 55, verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. Your thoughts are... I am a little bit bad. I'll try to get back. Your thoughts are, maybe if I go to church long enough, maybe if I work hard enough at it, maybe if I improve, maybe if I read the self-help books, maybe I'll make progress. Maybe I'll change this way or that way. But listen, this is a lot better. It's called the gospel. The gospel is the gospel of Christ. It's the message of grace. It's the work of God. It's the forgiveness of Christ. It's the ministry that is shockingly important, that saves and changes a man or a woman. I, I met a man in Dundalk yesterday. Uh, we were so, Jeremy and I, we were so winning with Randy and others, and we met this man, he said, uh, he said, thanks for sharing. He put his hand out, we shook hands. He goes, thanks, that, that, that's really good. You're out here talking, telling people. I go, what's your story? He said, I, 10 years ago, I was a heroin addict. I moved away from Baltimore, I went to Ocean City. Down there, I was trying to make it, I went to a worship center, a church down there, and I got free. And Jesus Christ changed my life. And it's been 10 years now I'm back in Baltimore and I'm looking for a church. 
and we invited him. And uh, he said, I can't come tomorrow, but maybe the next time. And that would be great to have him. But I'm just saying God works by the gospel. The gospel means God does it. The gospel is the gospel of grace. Now turn to Romans 8, please. And this is the, I just explained to you the context of this chapter 8. And we're going to look at a great promise here, which all of us need to understand. And it's in verse 28. <clears throat> Praise God. Say, praise God with me, please. Praise God. Say it loudly. Hey! How about shouting like I can? Hey! Hey, praise God. Hey, hey! The gospel. The gospel. Wow. What is this? The greatest thing anybody. Look at verse 28. We are assured and know that God being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good. This is amplified. We know all things work together for good. All things. We know. Now, that's not the, the only part of our message. I, we're going to move kind of get going, go to verse 29. But I want to make a point here. All of us should know that everything that happens in our life is by the sovereign hand of God allowed. There are things that God allows to happen in your life the good and the bad. And he allows it, and we are also guilty of making bad decisions and finding ourselves in trouble. But this verse is the overall end game, the plan. End game, what happens? Everything works together for good for us that are redeemed, that, that means you are saved for us that are sanctified, made righteous. Now, sometimes we see the good. I, I drive up 95, I make it to my destination, I make a call, I end up with a benefit, something works out, I say at the end of the day, Lord, that was amazing, thank you. All things work for good. I can see it. Hallelujah. In the circumstances. Next week, I drive up 95. I'm in a car accident. I make the wrong, wrong phone, phone call. I talk to the wrong person. I get in some trouble. I end up in jail. All things do not work for good. Now, I cannot see that. What's, what's the point? This is working for good. Is it bad? It is. How did it happen? Long story. I don't really know how all that happened. It just happened. I don't know. I made some bad decisions, and I met the wrong people, and I made the wrong statement. I, I got in some trouble. I can't, re I, don't re I can't believe this happened to me, and here I am. And things do not work for good. According to me, my eyes, my experience, please work on this in your heart and in your mind. Because the Bible is saying, I want to say more. The Bible is saying it, but I want you to hear it from God. I want you to grow in your relationship with God, with your own Bible, in such a way that you become a believer in what God is saying and that it will challenge your natural man. Sometimes we just go to the refrigerator. Remember that message? But what is on top of the refrigerator is what my mom brought home and doesn't want me to get. 
and I can't see it, but I can feel it. I'm tall enough because I'm 13 years old, and when I reach it, I, oh, I pushed it back. I can't see it, but I know Mama came home and put the goodies up there, and it's up there, but I cannot see it, and I cannot get at it. That's where you want to live. You want to live by faith. You want to live for the things that you cannot get your hand on. You want to believe that this is going to work together for good, though I cannot see it, but he said it. And I might not even see it in this lifetime, but it says in the next verse, 29, it says, for those whom he foreknew. Let's draw a picture for that. For those whom he foreknew. Let's draw a circle. This is for no or for knowledge. What does it mean? Before you were made, God knew everything. There are no surprises. The day you ended up in jail and you were innocent or you ended up in jail and you were guilty, God already knows all details about every life in every way. There is no question about it. And he knows you from eternity past. And he makes a link, uh, a chain. We're going to make a chain with these words in, the, in these two verses in a, in a minute. But read 29 with me, please. For those whom he foreknew, of whom he was aware and loved beforehand, he also destined from the beginning for ordaining them to be molded into the image of his son and share inwardly his likeness that he might become the firstborn among many brethren. End game, you're going to be like Christ. That's what he foreknows and has planned. And game, have you ever, you got, ever get in trouble and then there's a bigger game going on? Have you ever gotten into a situation and the thing is so little compared to the big thing? Like maybe you got in trouble, you owed your brother a dollar, and your dad go, comes home and says, I got a surprise for you, and it, it's a big game changer. Anything happen where, you know, you failed in a test, but then like something came into the picture? You got a scholarship, and who cares about the spelling test? There's a big game changer. There's something heavy duty and big that is happening in your life. And you're sitting in prison saying, like, how does this work together for good? And I don't blame you. I wouldn't want to be in that, and I'm not welcoming it either, Lord. <laughs> I don't want to be in trouble. But I mean, if you are, there's a promise. There's a mindset. There's a mentality that you must learn that is just on the top of the refrigerator, just beyond your reach, but it is yours. And God wants you to have it, but he can't give it to you without you living by faith. For when you live by faith, God reveals by his spirit his mind. And I want to hit that point. By faith, you live by faith. You don't only get saved and you're here like you're just kind of here and good solid ground. You got saved and here you are. But you are, you are saved and I want to go by faith. I want to live by faith. So we start going to church. Your mother, your mother says, what are you doing? I'm going to church. I thought you went there last week. Yeah, Mom, I go all the time now. Uh, why do you do that? Because I'm, Mom, I'm living by faith. I'm praying. How? By, by faith. I'm reading the scripture by faith. I've got new friends in my life by faith. I'm making decisions by faith. I'm not stopping. 
I, I started by faith and I want to live by faith. I'm going to forgive people by faith. I'm going to pray for my enemies by faith. I'm going to learn how to live this life by faith because I, God has planned that I would be conformed to his image. And I'm going to take it. Now listen to this. If I don't take it, it's still guaranteed that I will be conformed to the image of his son. Well, then why do it? Because life is meant to know God. And my benefit is that I get to know God. And can you know God without faith? Not really. The way you know God is to live by faith, for without faith it is impossible to please him. Listen, my daughter's on the top of the car. She's like two years old. Bethany, come on, jump. Nope. Come on, Ben, come on. Okay, so we got to work with her. But she doesn't jump, so it's the end of the game. I mean, it's not any fun. Not any fun for her or for me, because I just take her down from the car. Okay, that's the way it is. That's no problem. Maybe she will learn. You understand what I mean? Like, God is not forcing us. It must be free will. God is not making it a condition for salvation. He has decided to save us when we were lost. So nothing now in my life, belief or unbelief, is not going to change the grace of God that went all the way to the cross while I was an unbeliever and died for me when I was a sinner. That could not change what he had decided in eternity past regarding you and I. But having decided that and revealing it to us, then why wouldn't we trust in a living God that has more for us than we could ever imagine? Look at verse 32 says it. He that spared not his own son, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Okay. Now look at 29, we have foreknowledge, and we're almost done here in a few minutes, but look at verse 30, and you're going to have to help me, because I need you to call out the word. Guys, there's a link of five words here, and we're going to make a, uh, on our sketch up here a chain, and I want you to see something in the chain. The first word is foreordained, foreknowing, rather. What's the next word? Predestined. We can use the King James. What is it? Whom he did foreknow, them he also did predestine. Who predestined us? God did it. Then what's the next word? He called. Who did it? God called us. What's the next word? Justified. That's it's the next one. Justified. What's the next one? Glorified. Who did that? God did all these. There are five of them. Kind of, you can remember it because the grace is five letters in English. Grace, right? None of them were done by man. Man, man did not, it was, he doesn't foreknow. He didn't predestinate. He did not call. He did not justify. And he does not glorify. Only God can do these words, these actions of God. Uh, why is this important? Because we are to be people with assurance. We, we are to be people that have confidence about God and his nature. This is about the nature of God, that he is the God of grace. And he wants us to know it. If I don't know it, if I don't know that, that God saves me by his grace and that he keeps me and that my salvation is secure... Uh, then how can I really evangelize so well? 
I know I could, but they would answer back to me, all right, you're saying I can get saved by the grace of God, right? And I say, right. Then are you sure, are you saved? And you say, I hope so. So it, it like, why would I, you hope so? Are you, do you, are you sure about it? Yeah, I hope I am. You know, there are some little, you know, you better behave once you get saved. The guy will say, you know what, I don't behave well. Maybe this won't work for me. Guys, uh, I need something powerful. I need something extraordinary. I, I, we are able to say we have something extraordinary. Only God does it. God keeps you. God saves you. And God has promised that the end game is you are conformed to the image of his son. Are you sure? Yes. As sure as the reality of the incarnation, God's love for the world. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Not to condemn us, but to save us. Once being saved, we would, we would realize the gospel, that this happened by the grace of God, that he reached all the way. And uh, you might say, you know, am I really that bad? The answer is you are. You are. You, you, you can't believe how bad you are. We're knocking on doors here in Baltimore. One woman said, I, I, she opened the door. I said, you know, I, I'm sharing the message of, you know, we are sinners. She said, oh, I'm not, I'm not that really. My, and you can ask my neighbor. So, all right, so I did. I went to the next door. I said, this woman said that she's not that bad. And they said, yes, she is. And she's, very, she's a nice woman and so on. And I said, do the police have her records? And um, I, I said to the woman, so we started, it was lighthearted and I'm having a good time with her. And I said, wow, you are a good woman. Your neighbor says so, you say so. I'm tending to believe that you are. You are, I am sure. Compare us as people talking about you, you're not, you got it. You're, you're a good one. You're one of those good ones. And she goes, you yeah. know. I'm glad you recognize that. I'm glad you know that. I go, now listen, I got to ask you a question. If God was here, what would he say about you? Are you good? Are you really? Every thought. I mean, in the eyes of the police department, you're like number one citizen. But in the eyes of God, you aren't. And this is where the gospel comes in, because life is tragic, and the only answer is glorious gospel, resurrection, gift of God, salvation, work of grace. Let's not fool ourselves. And once we have that, we have the greatest thing that anybody could ever have in this life, a relationship with a holy God, prayers that pray that, that can move mountains, a fellowship with the living Christ, a, a relationship where God said, I am your father, a relationship where God says, I will never leave you, never forsake you. Though you go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will be there with my rod and my staff. They will comfort you, and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's a great error lurking in our countryside, streets, and cities. Great error. People do not know this amazing gospel. That it's all by grace. We had pa Pastor Ray here this morning. He shared he's been going into the woods along Route 40, back up past the tra tracks there. And there's more than 600 homeless people that live in the woods back there. And we see them come out, and they're panhandling on the 
Route 40 and the streets and so on. And they, he said 60 of them, he's gone in with his team, and 60 of them have come to this church in one year. And this is what he said. 32 have gotten saved. I've heard a few numbers. 32 have come, 60 have come. 32 have gotten saved. 12 are out of the woods and they live in homes. And 16 of them have overdosed and died. And I was thinking, the gospel, that's the answer. The gospel, Christ preached. Prayers, love, faith. How do you go into the woods? By faith. How do you share your, the message with somebody you don't know on a college campus? Uh, by wisdom, by faith, by love, by prayer. And you say, God, open my mouth so that I can love people in my heart and share the message. Because this is what it means. Look up on the screen. There are people walking the earth today. God foreknows them. God predestines them. God calls them, God justifies them, and God glorifies them. And it's all sure. It's done. Because when God's Son died on the cross, he did all of this so that we would be reconciled to a living and a holy God. And that living and holy God would be in our life on a day-to-day -day basis. And that living and holy God would anoint us with the Holy Spirit so that we could think about him and love him, and relate to him. And he goes, come on, jump. And then we, we jump, and he catches us. And it's his delight that we live by faith. And it's our joy that we can feel him, his presence, his mind, his heart. There it is. Look at verse, in closing, 31. What shall we say to all of this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Wow. Here I am. I got a good day, good week, good month, good year, good 10 years. Okay? I don't want this to happen, but I have a bad day, bad week, bad month, bad 10 years. But I don't have bad 10 years. If God is for me, who can be against me? I can feel it. The Holy Spirit is saying, I am with you. Joseph, I am with you in prison. Interpret the dream. I can't interpret any dream, but if you can give me the interpretation, you are God. You can do that for me. Yes, I can. For your prison cell is not really such a big deal to me. I am God, and I have a day when I'm going to bring you out. And Joseph is one of those stories where you can see that all the things that happened to him worked for good. But we can't always, we cannot always see it. But we can know it. That if God, God, where's God? Ah, I got the cookies. Where's God? I got it. If God is for me, who can be against me? I got it. I got it in the church, in uh, the Holy Spirit. I got it in, I, I don't know, it just happened to me. I live by faith. I got it in the prayer meeting. Please gather together as small groups. Please gather together and encourage. Please give phone calls to each other and edify and learn how to use your gifts and be edifying and reach out and help each other out in the life of faith. Guys, God is amongst us. Read books. Have fellowship with Christ. Stir up your heart. Stir up your faith. Don't beat up yourself, but be edified in the faith. Guys, our God, if he is for us, who can be against us? One time, now I'll finish with this one. I really will. I think so. But I got to just say, one time I wondered, I go, is the blessing left me? Has the blessing left me? This kind of came upon me some 
time in this past months, you know, I just had that thought. Is the blessing gone? Yes, it could be gone. No, it's not. I mean, I mean, I want the blessing of God, but just think about this. Is the blessing gone? Now, I had this thought about it or feeling about it, and I thought, oh my gosh, that would be horrible if the blessing was gone. The only thing I have is that. Who cares if you have, uh, if you have, uh, you know, you have this or you have that. The things that people look for in life, like do you have a great wife or uh, healthy children or a nice house or a good job or something. I mean, people have, that's what they look for. But I, I, I am thankful for what I have, but I have to go to the other place and I got to say, have I, is the blessing of God on my life. That is irreplaceable. It doesn't matter how great your wife is if you don't have the blessing of God on your life. It doesn't matter. If I'm a single man and I'm blessed of God, I am blessed of God. If I don't have much money and I got a blessing, I got a blessing, I got, I'm blessed of God Almighty. God has blessed me. <laughs> you see what I mean? And you are. And I am. I, I mean, I, I did some praying. I got to check my attitude. I go, Lord, whatever you do, don't take that from me. Because I, I, it's the only thing that matters at the end of the day. Who cares about all the other things? Seek not the things that are of the world. Seek the things that are that are in heaven. Seek the things that make a profound difference. Seek the things that really matter. And what I'm saying to you this morning is you see the ring? That chain cannot be broken because none of those links are dealing with men. They're not from men. Men don't do these things. God does them. And from the beginning to the end, from foreordination to glorification, it's all happened in the mind of God. It's all done and finished. It's all what's called in the Greek, aorist tense. It's not a time-sensitive tense in the Greek. It's just a state, like that door is closed. See that door right there, number two? It's closed, and that's all that it means. Doesn't mean it is closing, it will close, or that it has been closed. It just sa says it's closed, period. Nothing to do with time. Same with these words. They are not, you will be or, or predestined, you will be called, you will be justified, you will be glorified. It is all done. It's finished. Because when God received his son, he also received you. And it's all done and finished. Because when God said, come up and sit at my right hand, then that made it clear that you and I, though we are sinners, have been justified by a living God through the blood of his Son, making our life secure. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Okay? Amen. This is an important part of the service. We had three hands this morning, and the 9 o'clock service was beautiful. And uh, we want to pray right now for anybody listening, anybody sitting here, anybody kind of not knowing for sure, anybody kind of thinking about it, anybody who's never come by faith to Christ to do it this morning. And it is serious and powerful. All you do is believe in him. You say, I have doubts. It's okay. A mustard seed is enough. You're saved by faith. Believe in him. Believe that Jesus Christ came. Believe that Jesus Christ was raised. Believe in Jesus personally. And you are saved by his grace, forgiven and justified. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe in you, that's all. Just, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. 
It's in your heart. It's what you're at. It's between you and God. We want to assure you, if you're saying that prayer, you are born again. You are saved. Your sins are forgiven. Your name is in the book of life. God is your Father. You can talk to him and will relate to him. And, and he keeps you and loves you and will teach you and show you. It's beautiful. You repent from your evil ways. You say, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to change my, turn it over. I'm going to believe you because of your new birth. God gives you a new nature. Now feed it. Walk with him by faith. God will answer you. It's not hard. It's very easy. It's God loves you. That's all. He loves you. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. Then would you raise your hand if you're saying that prayer, just as so the ushers can give you a book, and we could just recognize that you're saying yes to Jesus. Anyone here? Just raise your hand. Anybody? Yes to Jesus. Anybody? All right, then uh, amen. Then would you just say to your neighbor for a minute, just say, uh, just talk to them about salvation. Say to your neighbor, when did you get, when did you accept Christ as your Savior? Would you do that just with your neighbor for a moment? When did you accept Jesus? Okay, would you stand, please? <clears throat> okay. Yeah, come on, stand up, please. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Wow. Praise God. Praise God. Father, we pray you would dismiss us as we go this morning. We've been in your house. You're feeding the flock. You're speaking to our hearts. You're helping us in our lives. We have many, many things we, we learn to cast our care on you. You are showing us the way. We are learning prayer, learning discipleship, learning to live by faith. We pray for our families, who are amazing, deep work in the lives of our loved ones. Oh, God. Sometimes we have a burden for our family and we need someone to come alongside and help us carry the burden in prayer and in love. Sometimes at work we have a burden for what's going on at work and we need somebody to come alongside and encourage us and maybe a word of wisdom, a word in season and help us in our working place and answer prayer. Because the enemy is for real. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. Thank you. Hear our prayers. Bless this week in Christ's name. And lead us, Lord, in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.